Normally, when we talk about revitalizing liberal democracy and democratic institutions, we talk about citizens and different kinds of political actors. But in an era where populism makes for strange bedfellows, some see a new role for corporations in defending liberal values. Joining us now to debate that proposition in Seattle, Washington, Christine Bader. She is author of Evolution of a Corporate Idealist, When Girl Meets Oil. She's also a former director of social responsibility at Amazon. In New York, New York, Bhaskar Sunkara, founder and editor of Jacobin Magazine. And here in our studio, Sarah Kaplan, director of the Institute for Gender and the Economy at the Rotman School of Management at U of T, and Seva Gunitsky, professor of political science at the University of Toronto and the author of Aftershocks, Great Powers and Domestic Reforms in the 20th Century. And it's nice to have you two back here in our studio. And to our guests and points beyond, nice to have you on our program for the first time. Let me just set up the discussion we're about to have with a few examples here. Sheldon, if you would, this graphic. After the American administration's travel ban, much debated and discussed, hundreds of tech CEOs, both in Canada and the U.S., denounced it. Starbucks announced it would hire 10,000 refugees. Nordstrom and Macy's and several other department stores have stopped carrying Trump family brands. And after President Trump's remarks about Unite the Right, that rally in Charlottesville, CEOs from major companies, including General Electric, Intel, and 3M, left his manufacturing and business councils. And then during this past year's Super Bowl, Budweiser ran an ad that got a great deal of pickup, a great deal of play, and it went something like this. Roll tape. You don't look like you're from around here. I want to brew a beer. Welcome to America. You don't want it here. Go back home. Abandon ship. Welcome to St. Louis, son. Beer for my friend, please. Thank you. But next time, this is the beer we drink. Such a great commercial for such bad beer. Oh, am I, am I allowed to say that? Maybe I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, Christine, get us started here, please. Why do you think corporations are wading into politics more and more these days? Sure. Well, I think the main reason is self-interest. And of course, that isn't new. Companies have always weighed in on things that matter to them. What is new, though, is that in the past, the things that they have weighed in on might have been matters that didn't really touch us as individuals, as communities. It might have been tax codes. It might have been technical regulation. But now what is clear is that the issues that impact us as individuals and as communities and as a nation, immigration, healthcare, cultural conflict, really do impact businesses. So I think that's why they're stepping in. Oscar, as you looked at that ad, did you come away from it thinking, my goodness, Budweiser is sincerely taking a moral stand on one of the big issues of our time? Well, well I, I would say that, that they are correct on this issue, right? And there, there is certain ways in which aspects of the corporate elite are more correct on issues pertaining to immigration, let's say, than aspects of the more populist, nativist right in the United States and elsewhere. I would say this, there's this conflict between Donald Trump's kind of more nativist aspects of his, his uh, politics and what maybe pr certain segments of, of pro-corporate um, you know, forces in the, the country might want. But imagine if Donald Trump was a social democrat instead of a right-wing populist. Imagine if he was trying to raise the minimum wage and do all sorts of other things. I think you would still see a corporate backlash of a different type. So, so I'm wary of, of putting this responsibility on corporations as opposed to real democratic actors in society, and corporations are simply not that. That's not even uh, necessarily a, a fault, right? Corporations have a narrow interest, and that's to deliver profits to shareholders. Um, I, I don't think we should be, you know, expecting them to uh, to uh, hold the, the mantle for progressive politics. Okay, we have two sort of not completely convinced there, Sarah, about the moral rectitude of corporations, even though they may be taking the view that many in society think is the right moral view to take. Where are you on this? 
Well, I agree that a lot of the actions that they're taking are aligned with their interests, but I think that those interests are now being shaped by a number of different forces. So, for example, when you have consumers who are starting to engage in hashtag delete Uber uh, campaigns and things like that, um, that is leading corporations to need to push in directions that satisfy the needs of those consumers as they're being reflected. And so I think that there's an aspect which has to do with the social activism that is leading them to do things that align more closely with that social activism because they're either appealing to consumers or those are the people they're trying to hire as employees and they need to position themselves in ways that make them attractive to employees. So as the famous millennials, I'm not sure I ever understand what the famous millennials are, but as the famous millennials become more powerful consumers and the uh, people who are the core employees of corporations, they're going to have to move in directions that appeal to those communities. And so there is an alignment there that's broader than uh, the kind of the, the narrow profit self-interest per se. Seva, are you going to unambiguously come down on behalf of the corporations and say, yes, they're doing the right thing for the right <laughs> reasons, period, full stop? Uh, I'm having a lot of trouble picturing corporations as the defenders of liberal democracy. Uh, and I think uh, what your guests have said is right. Uh, a lot of the motivation behind these ads is self-interest and publicity. The fact that we're airing the Budweiser ad on the station and talking about it suggests that they're at least partly successful. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are real divergences in the policy preferences of corporations and the Trump administration. So all the things that Trump talks about in a sense of a vague threat, the free movement of people, the free movement of capital. Uh, those are things that have benefited the corporations a lot over the last few decades. And those are the things that he's complaining about. So I think part of the outcry uh, stems from a real difference in how they see the world. Here's uh, the U.S. business editor of The Economist magazine, Matthew Bishop, writing as follows. In recent years, business, especially large Western multinationals who care about their reputation with customers and or potential employees, have become one of the more progressive forces in society at least in terms of promoting inclusivity on gender, race, and sexuality, and increasingly outside of the carbon-based industries on seeking solutions to climate change. If the Trump administration is determined to lead the world into a turn-back-the-clock regressive era, much will depend on whether today's mainstream business executives step in to fill the progressive leadership void. Christine, how much do you think uh, today's business leaders, today's multinationals, have sort of become a progressive force in America, stepping into that so-called void? Well, I think that some of them are. I think I would agree with Matthew Bishop that businesses can be a progressive force. I certainly wouldn't say that all of them are. Um, one of the uh, business leaders I interviewed for my book was Jeffrey Hollander, who was one of the co-founders of Seventh Generation, the green consumer goods company. And one of the things that he said to me was that I see my role as a business leader as demonstrating what is possible. And so again, getting back to self-interest, we see a lot of companies really stepping up their investments in, for example, renewable energy, regardless of what the cl policy climate dictates, because it's a win-win for them. So again, I think that where we see the alignment of business and societal interests, businesses absolutely will step up, show the world what is possible, even in the face of regulations that might work against them. And let me do a quick follow with you here, because we mentioned off the top that you used to be director of social responsibility at Amazon. Before that, you worked for BP Oil, which has not exactly had a, um, you know, a pristine <laughs> reputation uh, over the last few years uh, on the uh, climate mm -hmm. change file. I wonder how much of a yeah. dent that put in your sense of yourself as a corporate idealist. Yeah. Uh, there's a quote from the poet W.H. Auden. There's a great deal of difference between believing something still and believing it again. <laughs> so when I joined BP, I barreled out of business school and thinking I was going to change the world and business was going to be the platform by which I would do that. And my first few years there, I had full license to invest in partnerships with local communities around where BP was operating, try to make sure that our presence there could be a win-win for communities and for the business. Um, but then obviously after the Deepwater Horizon disaster and a very different BP emerged in the aftermath of that, it really made me question everything I thought I learned about business. So I started interviewing a lot of my peers doing similar roles in other companies at Disney, at The Gap, Coca-Cola, Yahoo. 
And what re-inspired me to believe in business's potential was this word that everybody kept bringing up, and that was incrementalism, that recognizing that we still have a lot of work to do, and that I certainly didn't manage to transform all of BP, but looking at both the specific projects that I worked on and taking the long view, we actually have had a positive impact. It's not good enough, it's not fast enough, it's not big enough, but it is moving the needle. Oscar, can I get you to react to that? Well, well first of all, I think it's a bit disappointing. You know, I, I'm a socialist, but, but to hear an economist editor say that the progressive role of corporations is just in uh, merely pushing, pushing the envelope on these things, I think actually does a discredit to what one could make as a progressive case for capitalism in the last few decades, which would be, you know, the role that companies have played, you know, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China, India, Brazil, elsewhere. So I, th I think, if anything, it was is quite a, a narrow um, way to defend uh, uh, capitalism. Now, as far as these corporations, it is true that some companies, like Google, for example, are very good, or have been good, at least as it relates to their employees on LGBT issues and, and on other, other things. But I think we should be very wary of leaving it to the whims of these corporations. Uh, a lot of them are populated by people who really do uh, hold progressive views on social issues. But when it conflicts with their bottom line, I think the priorities of the bottom line will always win off. And that's why we need the state. We need a democratic uh, uh, polity to, to actually push for regulations um, on, these, on these businesses. Because you could say that, sure, we want more diversity. And among a pool of, of hires, um, I'm sure corporations now would, would push towards more democratic, more, more egalitarian hiring practices. But will they actually invest, for example, in education in disadvantaged communities? And will they actually do all these other, other things instead of just cherry picking among members of the professional class? And I think that's, that's something corporations won't do. It's also something I don't think they can do. That's something that we need the state to do. Sarah. Well, I, I completely agree with the comments that have been made so far, in particular with the concern that we don't want to abdicate the social agenda to corporations. Um, and, you know, we worry about that alignment with the bottom line. On the other hand, a, a, a maybe even a more positive note than the incrementalism might be the fact that corporations have lots of resources and are filled with smart, innovative people who are working on business problems. And, the potential that I think Christine is talking about is the potential to harness those resources uh, towards solving some problems. Now, I agree that there's going to be some potential for conflicting agendas, but I talked to a friend of mine who's the chief sustainability officer of, let's say, a quite major corporation in the world uh, after the Trump election, and I said, so now what are you going to do? And she said, we're going to keep pushing. We're not going to stop. It's going to make it harder for us, but we're not stopping. Can you tell us what kind of, I appreciate you don't want to name the business, but what kind of Global, global corporation <laughs> in the Fortune 10, let me put it that way. Um, but a, bi a business that has, you know, really global scale, and they're not going to stop. And the reason they're not going to stop is because, one, it aligns with business, but, two, they believe that this is the, the future of how corporations should operate. And what, what the constraints are actually doing is forcing them to put more innovative talent on solving these problems. So I don't want to be completely rah-rah for corporations, but I do think that there is a way in which that if their interests do align with these problems, we can actually get potentially more innovative, more creative, more radical solutions, maybe more than just the incrementalism um, that some people are hoping for. Seva, I well remember many years ago when Michael Jordan, the basketball player, was asked, mm. why don't you come out more strongly on issues that you care about? His answer was, well, Republicans buy shoes too, and that's why he didn't want to. So I'm wondering why you think Budweiser would take out this ad knowing surely that lots of people who drunk who drink rather Budweiser beer uh, are, are not too keen on immigration. Uh, well, I think it's a lot easier to criticize a president who has fairly low popularity ratings. I think that's one thing. And not just that, uh, a president who has opponents who are so viscerally opposed to his policies. So if you're in the corporate boardroom and you're making decisions about which segment of your demographics you're trying not to offend, that makes the calculation a little bit easier. But I think it's also a part of a broader symptom of the fact that politics have steeped into everyday life in a way that was not the case even two or three years ago. And so I think if corporations feel that they want to participate in that conversation, they have to make a statement of some sort, even if part of their 
demographic may disagree with it. You guys all know this expression, I'm sure. It'll be new to, to, new to me and new to some others. Um, woke. You take a political stand and now you're woke. Does anybody want to, who, who wants to give me a handy dandy definition of what woke means? I can. Go I, ahead, Sarah. <laughs> so woke, first of all, is a term that's now becoming much more popular socially. It's the past tense of of uh, awake, and uh, it's been it kind of developed through the African American community, in particular in association with Black Lives La Matter, to mean that I am awake to the social injustices and the systemic structural problems in our society. In the in case of Black Life, Lives Matter, clearly around around race, but it has become much more popular. It's gotten much more sort of branded. I worry a little bit about the cultural appropriation associated with mm -hmm. taking that term. Um, so but, oh, I was just going to say, mm -hmm. but I think we need a different term. It's a sort of substitute for political correctness, which we can't use anymore because the right has weaponized that term to be a way to critique people who are trying to basically say, I am aware that there are social injustices. So it's become an alternative term that can kind of represent that kind of awareness. So, Bosker, is it good today for companies to be considered woke? I mean, li listen, I, I think it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If there's going to be, uh, a, you know, Forbes 500, you know, I would like half, at least half those CEOs to be to be women. I, I would like, you know, in the U.S. context, like 10, 12 percent of them to be to be black um, and, and so on. I think I think but that only gets us so far. I think if you really want to seriously address social issues based on oppression, you're going to have to eventually deal with the question of redistribution. And redistribution is a type of politics that I don't think corporations will be with us. Uh, I know for a fact they won't be with us on. So, so that's my, my concern. It only goes to the surface uh, level, and we might just see a rearranging of opportunity for the elites and for the professional middle class, for the college educated, and that is quite a bit different than the experience of, of most Americans. Christina, I saw you trying to get in. May I jump in, Steve? Sure. Yeah, sure. So just um, two comments. One on the woke point. I completely agree with Sarah that we need to be wary of the cultural appropriation of the term. Um, but just in the context of corporations, what I think of as woke with regards to business is it's about acknowledging and being much more aware of and taking responsibility for your externalities than companies have done in the past. And that's one thing that we're starting to see, again, recognizing that businesses are part of the problem with regard to economic inequality, with regard to climate change, and we're seeing more and more businesses take action. But I also wanted to tie that into uh, Seva's comment in the previous discussion about a CEO statement, and is that sincere, and what should we look for? And what I look for when a CEO or a company is making a statement is, how are they backing that up? A CEO can be as sincere as the day is long making a statement, but they need to back it up with staff, resources, and senior level accountability. Right? And so I don't actually care why a company might be making a statement. They might even be insincere, but if they're backing it up with staff, resources, and senior level accountability, then I'm going to look at that and say, actually, that company is putting its money where its mouth is. Hmm. Seva, let me go back to a point that was made right off the top, I think, by Christine, which is that there, there's a great deal of self-interest in what we're seeing right now as corporations take on the president, for example. I wonder to what extent you believe the bottom line of corporations is dependent on a healthy, thriving, liberal democracy for its prosperity. Well, well, you're right. Traditionally, we think of the two as moving together, that capitalism and democracy are sort of brothers in arms uh, moving through history. Uh, to what extent is capitalism dependent on it? I'm not sure, because historically speaking, the major capitalist states were capitalist well before they were democratic. In mm -hmm. other words, countries like Britain and, and the U.S. did not have suffrage for the majority of the population until the 20th century, but became capitalist well before then. So it's not clear that capitalism needs democracy. It may be that democracy needs capitalism, in which case it's a very unequal relationship, which is troubling for democracy. Uh, but you don't have to be a democracy lover to believe in capitalism. There was a survey in China and in the U.S. just a few years ago, and they asked, what is the best economic system for, for your country? And 68% of Chinese people said capitalism is the best system. Only 59 said so in the U.S. So, <laughs> really? so to me, that suggests that capitalism is morally flexible in a way <laughs> and is willing to coexist with pretty much any political system as long as the leaders of that system allow it to operate relatively independently, allow it to take home uh, 
its profits, so to speak. Well, sir, you know, the, the, uh, the former uh, federal liberal leader, Michael Ignatieff, I think he used the expression, capitalism is politically promiscuous. It yeah. can exist in authoritarian regimes. It can exist in liberal democratic regimes. Does capitalism need democracy to thrive? I think that there has historically been a relationship between the two. I, I'm not sure about the dependence, but I do know that in different eras, the corporate elite have responded differently to democratic pressures. So the last time that the corporate elite really came together in a very powerful way was in the 40s and 50s when labor unions were having their great um, you know, growth post uh, Second World War. And the corporate elite were quite unified in doing things that would uh, push down the labor movement. And when, that, when the labor movement finally was sort of uh, uh, taken apart, the corporate elite then fragmented. And now we're seeing a moment when at least many of the corporate elite are coming back together around this maybe, they, we've just had 20 years of massive globalization that the, the kinds of things that Trump is doing could really undermine. And so they're coming back together to protect the, the version of capitalism that involves globalization, free flow of, of uh, capital, free flow of people across borders. So right now we're seeing that. Of course, not all the corporate elite, because there's Hobby Lobby and Home Depot and mm -hmm. the Coke industries, which are very much on Trump's side right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not all of the corporate elite. Oscar, let me read something. This is from uh, Robert Kuttner, writing in the American Prospect earlier this year, and then I'll get you to comment on this first. Kuttner writes, there is a perverse and paradoxical symbiosis here. Corporate America and its Republican allies execute economic policies that make daily life more arduous for ordinary people. But they burnish their image by supporting liberal social causes like immigrant rights and protections for transgender people. And then the conservative social base gets mobilized against both trends. Somehow, the corporations escape the wrath of working class America. That gets deflected onto liberals, immigrants, blacks, and gays, Meanwhile, Democrats have been losing winnable elections because progressive cultural policies are easier for them to embrace than aggressively anti-corporate pocketbook policies. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there, Bosker. Why don't you start? Well, I, I think to begin with, I, it's important to, to note that there's a lot of, you know, people of color, um, you know, women, uh, gays, uh, I, the rest of the people on his, his list that are, in fact, part of uh, working class America. So I think we need to go beyond kind of the narrow frame of the way it's been used. I think a lot in the media in the United States where working class is synonymous with, uh, with just um, white, white people, when, of course, it, it, really, um, it really isn't. Uh, I, I would say, yes, there, there, is, there is something uh, to that. But, but we could even simplify it even, even more. Um, corporations um, are, are populated by, by people who have some, some degrees of autonomy. If you have a new a crop of, let's say, tech CEOs and, and workers that are mostly young, they have certain social and cultural sensibilities, and it's, it so happens that a lot of their audience do too. They're going to frame certain appeals in kind of a, a moral and, and uh, in line with their moral and social views. But once we get to the point that certain other, other demands cut into their bottom line, I think in the end, they'll have to, by nature of structure, not because they're bad people, they'll have to go and protect uh, their their bottom line. Um, I, I think we should less think about um, this kind of um, conservative backlash as being uh, fueled by um, uh, corporations so much as fueled by the lack of, of state and political um, uh, regulations. And the Democrats simply are a party of, of capital. The, the second most enthusiastic party of capital has been called before. We, we don't have a, a social democratic party in the United States. We don't have a party pushing for the interests of workers. So both uh, uh, different parties are going to differentiate themselves largely on social issues or, or to the degree that they'll, they'll believe in uh, deregulation or, or cutting down unions. But they, they have this, this commonality, which is, I think, based on something, something rational, based on how our system is, is, is set up. Christine, in your view, do you think individuals have more power nowadays to influence the decision of corporations than ever before? 
Potentially, I, I would segment those into two groups. So consumers, first of all, I still think that's a really mixed bag. I mean, when the front page New York Times expose of working conditions in Foxconn factories where iPads were made came out, there were a few protests in front of Apple stores, but people were participating in those protests, tweeting about it from their iPhones. So I think it's much more effective if consumers put their money where their mouth is, which frankly doesn't happen that often. But I will point to another trend, though, which is a generational shift shift in how we think about work. I think that people are less likely, certainly millennials are less likely and less willing to check their values when they walk into the office or when they log on for the day. So I think that we work more hours than ever. And I think that, therefore, it becomes less desirable and less possible, frankly, to divorce our values and the things that we want to fight for from what we happen to do to earn a paycheck. Seva, lest we get too pristine pure here, we do need to remember that, that corporations spend an awful lot of money trying to influence an awful lot of politicians to do their bidding. That's probably worth remembering in a moment like this, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I think there's a danger in thinking that when you have transparent uh, mechanisms like Twitter, that corporations will now be more accountable to the public. But of course, corporations can twist uh, the conversations on social media just as easily as the anti-corporate activists. We see this with government. Twitter was supposed to be the cure for autocracy. Twitter was supposed to overthrow dictators, but now we see that dictators are just as comfortable using things like Twitter for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason not to think that corporations uh, could do the same thing, uh, provide a veneer of accountability, uh, while also using social media and, and other venues to actually strengthen their message uh, and to avoid uh, further responsibility for certain things. Shall we channel our inner Mitt Romney here and point out corporations are people too? <laughs> no, I don't think corporations are people too, although they are made of people, absolutely. And I think, as Christine pointed out, uh, these people are increasingly going to be more interested in a different kind of conversation. I also think that at the corporate level, we are starting to see companies realize that maybe this role of the corporation to uh, just drive the bottom line may not be the only role of the corporation. You see Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, saying, I basically am going to try to do things that are also good for society, that are good for the environment. And if my shareholders don't like that, they can stop being shareholders. And so he's actually, you know, the, the shareholders that who have stayed with Unilever are those that are interested in being uh, investing in a company that has a certain set of values. That's pretty gutsy to say that, eh? Yeah, yes, and I, he gets very lauded for being gutsy, and I think the test is Christine's test, which is, are you putting your money and your resources against that? Are you willing to sacrifice profits? I think more companies are starting to do that. And part of that is because investors are shifting their values, too. We see uh, environmental social responsibility types of investment funds growing at 25, 30, 40 percent a year. It's now uh, many billions of dollars that invest only in companies that meet certain of those kinds of tests. And I think companies are also going to be shifting because of the pressures from investors themselves. I think there's a new conversation. Again, I don't want to say, you know, be, as I said before, too rah-rah about corporations, but I think there is a new conversation in corporations about how can we think beyond just total return to shareholders or the bottom line. Hmm. Oscar, is that to say that we are um, kind of at a new time in North American history, in as much as there's a new corporate belief system that, that is actually ideologically in opposition to the current Trump administration and all that it stands for. Are you prepared to go that far? Portions of the corporate elite are obviously in opposition to Donald Trump, right? Uh, portions of the corporate elite in other contexts have, have uh, reconciled themselves to very different uh, political systems. There's thriving corporations in places like Sweden that have to deal with uh, a level of worker power and, and tax rates that, that capitalists in the U.S. would, would shudder at. But I would say, most importantly, that profits still matter for corporations more than anything else. If in the short term you're passing up on profits, then you better have a plan to recoup in the medium or long term. Otherwise, you're just going to be out-competed and undercut by other, other companies that are able to accumulate more money, to invest in new products, to do all sorts of other, other things. I don't think it makes any logical sense for a company to undercut their short-term uh, of profits behind a purely ideological agenda. It only makes sense if they think that their ideological agenda is in line where, where if not consumers are today, they will be in three, four, five, five years. 
I want to thank all four of you for coming on TVO tonight for a very smart discussion about a fascinating new topic. Christine Bader in Seattle, Washington, with the great title of that book, Evolution of a Corporate Idealist When Girl Meets Oil. Bhaskar Sunkara, founder and editor of Jacobin Magazine, and back here in our studio, Sarah Kaplan, the director of the Institute for Gender and the Economy at the Rutman School of Management at U of T, and Seva Gunitsky. Здравствуйте, Seva. Здравствуйте. Okay. <laughs> Professor of Political Science, University of Toronto, and you can read more of his work in his book, Aftershocks, Great Powers and Domestic Reforms in the 20th Century. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.